Okay, so um, when I heard the title for this uh, this talk, I thought, well, people are going to think this is for gardening today because it's cool weather. Like right now, it's it's not exactly burning hot outside, but that is that is not necessarily what we're talking about here. Um, so let's see if I can get this to go. There we go. Okay, so what will you learn during this particular talk is what is cool weather gardening? I'm going to talk about climates and microclimates. Um, we're also going to, where the site selection is very important for this, and what plants and varieties that will succeed, because not everything does. Uh, whether you should be focusing on seeds versus transplants, and that is kind of an open question on that one. Uh, when exactly to plant, that is a major, major issue. Uh, the irrigation needs, any pests that we can manage, and ways for the plants to survive in the cool weather. So, so what exactly is cool weather gardening? Basically, it is when you're growing vegetables, then your plan is to harvest them in late fall, or even through the winter, or even uh, next spring. So as opposed to harvesting things in the fall that it was just your normal garden, this is aimed to be later is the idea. Um, so generally, in, in the general pattern, this is when you plant in July or August, and then you, uh, when it's warmer, and then you get to harvest over the next months. So uh, it's different than, well, this summer is so weird, but it's different than planting uh, in, in May, ish and which didn't happen and uh, harvesting during the summer okay so you're harvesting in the winter is the is the basic point although some people just aim for fall and some people go for over winter too so there's more more options okay so um you need to find out specifically what works best for each plant that you're growing because each one has different start times sometimes or harvest times or different things so it's not a one size fits all uh, for example, broccoli, you can set it out in June or August, and you harvest it through the winter. But uh, garlic, you plant it in October, and you harvest it the next summer. So you can have quite the spread. So why would you have any advantage to doing this? Well, it does extend the growing season. You can grow fresh vegetables for more months of the year. That's usually the number one reason why people do this. And uh, you have fewer insect pests, but of course there are some. And Washington tends to have cooler summers and milder winters than other places, which makes it possible to do this. I'm not sure if they do this in places like, you know, Canada or North Dakota. But we can do it usually because we don't have such hard freezes. And then there's a big thing. The taste of the vegetables when they've gone through a light frost or something, like the carrots just get so much sweeter. Uh, and a lot of the plants, uh, that's something that happens for them. So that's a real advantage. Um, and not all, weather, uh, not, all, not all of this is done in the dead of winter. Here are some common options. You can plant a second summer garden. You can plant an over-the-winter garden, or you can plant in late fall intending for it to be for next spring. Uh, and you should try them all. And uh, your first option to grow a second crop, and I'm laughing because you'll see, you started in July, you grow plants that can be harvested before the fall freeze, which is ten generally around November 1st. And you choose varieties that can grow in a hurry so that they'll ripen by the time you get to that freeze. And uh, frankly, that is what most of us did this summer just to grow a regular summer. Because I just looked at my calendar at the end, middle to end of June, I was, I just put in my garden. I mean, my carrots are just coming up and it's July 5th. So, you know, that's maybe not an option for this year. You just start a garden on top of a garden. Uh, so your option B, this is the big one, is to plant in summer and harvest in winter. And it is for plants that can handle the cold, so you have to choose carefully. It is not for tender plants for tomatoes, like that kind of plant. Sorry. So that's kind of off the table. Um, 
the the uh, when you the way you do this is you plant in July and August only plants that can survive the winter. So here are some samples, although there's quite a few. This is not all you can plant. It's like cabbages work well, carrots, chard is another one, uh, beets, broccoli, and all the broccoli family, the kales, the Brussels sprouts. Although Brussels sprouts, mine didn't do so well last year. Um. And this is cool because your plants grow in the summer and then they hold in your garden like an outdoor living refrigerator. So another option is option C. You, you actually can plant very fairly late in the fall and then those seeds, hopefully don't get eaten by voles, uh, will sprout when it gets warmer in the spring. Uh, and my, my cousin has actually done this. She, she does it with peas and with uh, things like kale and broccoli, and they do sprout in the spring. And I've, I'm thinking this must, I haven't done it myself, but I'm thinking this must be true because I have millions of wild mustard seeds sprouting right now that certainly survived over the winter. I didn't plant them. They were thrown there by the weeds last summer. So uh, it certainly can work. Um, okay, but the spring idea, the key idea is make sh if you're going to grow them a little and then harvest them in the next spring is to make sure you get your plants. And this is maybe if you don't just do the seed version, but if you plant some things that are going to hold and then ripen later, you do want to get them established, but you do not want them anywhere near maturity because timing is everything. Uh, if you plant too soon, then maybe they'll suddenly grow and bolt and they won't hold for you. So make sure that your plants, that you, you space them out so that the ones you want to plant in the spring are just barely going so they can slowly grow over the winter and then take off in the spring. Or just plant the seeds for some things. Okay, I'm sure you're starting to have questions on this. Uh, anyway, bolted plants obviously don't do well. They're, they don't, they're done. I mean, you can eat the flowers before winter, but that's kind of a, an acquired taste. Okay, so how are you going to know when is a good time to start planting, and what about your microclimate? So Cowlitz County is generally 8, 8A to 8B, and our, that means that our minimum temperature over the winter in 8A, which is more of the higher elevations, is supposed to be between 10 and 15 degrees, which is a pretty really hard freeze. Um, 8B, 15 to 20, not so much. Uh, I mean, it's still freezing, so you got to keep an eye on that. Uh, and your garden may be different. Maybe you have higher elevation. Maybe you have some sloping ground where all the cold air flows down right into your garden and just gets colder there. Or maybe you have a nearby wall or a fence that can be uh, a little bit of reflected heat. Or maybe you have some sort of wind protection that would make it easier for your plants to survive. So your particular garden is uh, it's crucial to know what you have. Okay, so the key idea to this is knowing your last and first frost dates. So generally, May 1st-ish to November 1st-ish is supposed to be the, the frost-free zones, but you would have to keep your eye on the weather uh, to make sure you're, you're, I mean, you can estimate your planting dates based on that, but when it comes right down to it, if you're going to protect something, you might want to keep your eye on the weather and make sure you get it protected before it actually freezes. Um, the first frost date, frost date is uh, probably the most important because that's what you base your plantings on. You go backwards from that so many weeks for each plant. Uh, and be aware of cold snaps that it might really, really freeze. Um, and, of course, the rain. Be aware that the rain, we get 40 to 50 inches in our area, and 75% of that falls between October and May. I know this is totally news to you, that you've never, you know, experienced this, but there you go. Uh, also, the big thing is there's reduced sunlight, because the sun is so much lower in the sky that it doesn't uh, give as much light to the plants as it does in the summer. So when you're choosing your site, uh, you need to choose an area where it gets full sun in the winter, which may be a different pattern than in your um, summer garden. In my garden, I have an orchard going around it, uh, and in the summer, it's actually it, it, it's a little bit too much shade. 
Uh, but in the winter, of course, the leaves are off. So I'm I'm golden for this because I have pretty much direct sun. Uh, but you need you need to see your your angles and see if you have something that's you know lower in the in your landscape that might be blocking the sun that maybe it doesn't in the summer. And please watch out for drainage. Uh, this is not my yard, although it could have been my yard. Uh, sometimes I, in the winter I get standing water, and uh, we call it the lake. It just keeps coming and going. Uh, you want to avoid this in your garden. And the key idea here is if you have any of this issue, that you have some raised beds to get your plants up so they're not standing in the water. That's probably the number one problem in the winter for us. Okay, so how can you protect your plants if you've planted them? Well, one of the things is to watch out for, you know, wind if that's an issue for you. And also this frost pocket idea that, that cold air flows downhill and if it, it gets to a place where it can't, it just gets stuck, it can be significantly colder in that area. So you want to avoid that. Uh, if you have a building nearby, it can sometimes reflect some heat. Uh, if it's not too far away, or if you have a lot of wind, you can try blocking it and planting closer to the item that is blocking it so that it makes this kind of wind-protected area, if that's an issue for you. Um, that's an option. So those are some things you might want to think about. Uh, and, of course, mud. Here, My biggest problem with winter gardening, the first year I started it, was... I really didn't want to go out near those plants because I had, uh, before I had raised beds, I just had stuff planted in rows in the open ground and tiptoeing out there in the mud and I have very clay soil and just to look to see what the broccoli was doing, I ended up just not going out there. So watch out for that. Uh, and some suggestion is uh, you can get free wood chips from the city or some of the people around that do logging for people in there. They chip it, and then they want a place to put their chips. You can sometimes call those companies. Not logging, but, you know, like they come to your house, and they take out a tree, and then they say, do you want the chips? The answer is always yes. Uh, there's also free chips out uh, by Roy Morse Park, uh, but you have to load them yourself. Uh, I think think the city, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I think you can ask them to come and deliver them. Although I do want to warn you, if you get them in the summer, they're full of chipped up leaves. So that's a different kind of mulch. It's got the leaves and the chips mixed together. It, it works. It's just a little different. Um, or stepping stones or something. Um, so that's, that's actually very important. Okay, so... If you look at this chart, and just without reading it very well, you can just see that it has all these little lines here. The green lines mean seed, put a seed in the ground, and the um, black lines mean put a transplant in the ground. And you might notice just, just generally that the black ones, of course, are later because they've been growing somewhere else, and then you put them in the ground. And, in fact, let's take a look at this chart. This is from Territorial. So let's see how this works. Um, so if you had, if you for some reason wanted to plant arugula, uh, you may, it looks like you start it from seed, uh, basically end of July, August, September, and you can kind of plant them in stages so that they mature a little bit different. Uh, it looks like it would like some cover to protect it. It would benefit. Uh, your harvest window is between winter and spring, so a lot. And then these three columns have to do with storing it. If you take it out of the ground and you want to store it, you can only store it for about a week at this temperature and that humidity. So these three columns are a little deceptive, uh, because, or a little confusing, because they are for when you harvest it and then store it, which is important, but it's maybe not what we're looking at right here. But the freeze-out temperature is interesting. It, it's quite low. So arugula would be quite happy in our winter situation. Beets, they recommend direct seeding, could have some cover, especially for the leaves maybe. You can harvest it all winter, and it can get as cold as 15 to 20 degrees. I could be wrong, but I don't think we got anywhere near there last winter. Um, but someone, I'm sure, will tell me if I'm wrong. Fava beans which is an interesting crop. It, it puts on these beans. You grow it over the winter. It's also often used as kind of a cover crop because if you cut it off and leave the roots in the ground and grind them in, uh, it, it puts nitrogen into the ground because it's like all the other legumes. Uh, but you don't plant it until September or October. 
uh, and then you're expecting to pick to uh, to harvest them next the next spring and summer. So you can see how this works. Here's one that has uh, Brussels sprouts. Oh, let's try broccoli. Broccoli. Uh, you can plant it in the in May, June, or July, and then uh, or you can transplant it out, and then you pick it in the autumn. Well, and frankly, that's just sort of our summer thing, but. I, you can also try to hold it through the winter. If you get it fairly young uh, and then you hold it through the winter, uh, you can. The problem is if it starts to warm up at all, uh, it, it really goes to bolting in flowers very quickly. So, uh, But that is broccoli is commonly grown. And this one, the sprouting broccoli, you see that the planting date and the transplant dates are quite different. But the garlic is the best. Uh, down here, garlic is way over here in September and October, and you plant and then you harvest it five to eight months later. So that's how you read this chart, and you can use this kind of. And this is available to you on our website. This exact presentation and with these clickable links on it, uh, so you should be able to um, access this again if you wanted to from this slideshow. You just click right there. Okay. Uh, what else? Okay. So, so what should you do? You have this choice. Sometimes you should put it in the ground as seed. Sometimes you should plant it as a transplant. Well, you should use a planning guide like we were just looking at to decide should you do it, uh, which way should you do it. You should know that things like beets, for instance, much prefer being direct seeded right where they're going to grow. But broccoli for spring harvest is sometimes, uh, it can be too hot at the end of the summer to get that broccoli to come out of the ground. It's, it's a little, you have to really work at it. So sometimes you plant those as transplants because you can grow them in a more controlled environment. And uh, garlic uh, uses the cloves of the garlic. So technically it's not either a seed or a transplant, it's kind of both. Uh, but on the charts, they kind of color it like it's a seed because, you know, it's a chunk of the plant. Um, but that is a very successful crop for overwintering around here. Okay, so some vegetables you can use transplants or seeds. So what would be part of your decision making? Here's the big point. Because our gardening season is, is kind of latish and, and it takes up the ground right during the time when you would be planting for winter, unless you have an extra bed or something, a lot of times that garden space is already have things in it growing. Um, so one of the ways to get around that is to go ahead and do the transplants in a different location. And then as the ground opens up, as you harvest your summer, you can put in the winter garden. So that's another reason to lean towards transplants. Depends on how dedicated you are to not cooking them in your greenhouse or whatever place that you are <laughs> planting them. Not that I've ever fried plants in a greenhouse. Okay, maybe I did. Okay, so what about irrigation? This is this is a big deal uh, because keeping those er those transplants in that heat of August that is very uh, they're very important, and yet uh, it is often the hottest and driest part of the year. So you're constantly out there making sure that those plants. Are, are making it and not getting too dry and they're growing, uh, it, it's a little more difficult. Um, but you should keep the seeds and the little plants moist but not overly wet. Um, and it may, again, it may be easier to, to control this in a transplant situation. But you're up for a challenge. You want, you want to get out there in August and be watering those things. Okay, the pests in winter, uh, there are not quite as many, uh, but the but so like leaf miners in the leaves, the carrot fly in the carrots. I have had a lot of trouble with that. Uh, there's still aphids, possibly. You could see some cabbage loopers cutting the, or cabbage worms cutting in your leaves. Uh, the flea beetles on your on your seedlings and the onion thrips. I am not, know nothing about onion thrips, but they evidently are an issue. So uh, I should probably go check my onions for these today, but. These were some that were mentioned in the winter gardening research I did. And this, this is very annoying, um, but there is a solution. And of course, slugs. I don't think slugs ever give up. Uh, so what do you do? 
Well, this stuff over here, if you've never seen it or dealt with it, this is called floating row cover, and it's kind of like a dryer sheet, but it's huge. You can get it in great dimensions. You can get it 10 feet wide and 5 feet wide or whatever, and, has, and sometimes you can get it as long as your whole bed or your row. And uh, you can just lay it over your plants that are growing and kind of hold it down for the wind. And it does several things. It blocks the insects having access to the plant to infect it. So this is one of the number one ways to control that carrot fly. So if my carrots ever sprout, which is an issue, not that I have true confessions of my, uh, my plants, but uh, I need to do this because I have had a lot of trouble with that other thing. So, but the key idea for any pest is to please research that pest and then use integrated pest management, which means that you uh, look for the least toxic options first and you, you try maybe try some of a little of everything, like maybe cover it and maybe put some uh, BT on it if it's that's appropriate, uh, whatever you think is right. But you need to read the labels and you need to follow what you have there. Uh, you can try the roll covers. That seems to be very, it's just they can't get to it, they can infect it. Uh, and crop rotations can be can help. Uh, it, uh, maybe I, I will throw my brother under the bus. He he planted the same things in the same place for like 30 years, and he kept wondering why he kept having the same problems. the The problem can sort of stay with that area if you don't move things around sometimes. So that's an interesting thing. And there's lots of these charts online for what to go first, second, third, and fourth. Uh, this is just a real common one. Over here we have some pyrethrin, which is uh, generally an organic-ish uh, chemical treatment. It is based on a flower uh, that kills off insects. It's not completely safe. You know, it's not 100%. I mean, it's not like it's not a chemical. But, um, and you need to treat it carefully. But a lot of people prefer this kind of thing over some others. And this is a particular one for killing uh, those caterpillars. It specifically targets those caterpillars. Uh, and you can research this. But uh, these are just a couple options. Um, so there's other ways. So another thing besides protecting from plants, you might want to just protect them from the winter. So that uh, floating row cover, you can cover your plants. Uh, and some row covers give, can give, raise the temperature underneath there about 4 degrees. And if it's a thicker version, there's several versions out there. It can maybe be as high as 8 degrees. Um, honestly, the bigger issue sometimes is when you're covering things is that the sun and the heat can build up too much underneath there. So you want to be uh, know what's going on under these covers. Um, and so that's specifically true for these plastic uh, little covers, little greenhouses, you get a nice warm day and your plants may not be very happy. So I'm just a little scared of frying my plants because as I admitted, I have done that before. Anyway, so these are these are kind of interesting and a raised bed is kind of fun for these because you can just stick the PVC down next to the wood and arch it over and it can generally hold up. Uh, other people put little uh, the bigger PVC down in the sides of their beds and then they put the other PVC, just set it down in there and then they can take it off. And that's that's a nice option. Okay, and then there's a thing called cloches and they are, been you can look them up, they've been around for many, many years or maybe centuries and you can cover each individual plant and you will notice there's kind of a vent on this one, which is a nice option. Uh, some people use uh, cut out milk cartons or milk jugs uh, and you could take the lid off or on for venting. Okay, um, another thing we have on our website and on this slideshow is uh, a chart like this that one of our master gardeners made, and it's kind of interesting to look at, so let's take a quick look at that. Uh, so we have things like what varieties work well, and this says uh, plant in August 1st, uh, you can plant until September 1st if you're looking more for greens. Uh, it has a minimum temperature. Uh, one of the things down here, it says uh, some of the advice uh, is mature vegetables can be stored in the ground for cabbage. Okay. Um, and you can, and there's, little, uh, there's a little comment on some of these. 
I like corn salad, use the small leaf varieties, works better. So these are individual plants, suggestions for varieties and for uh, other notes that have been collected on this. It says best under a cloche to prevent rain damage. And I would agree, lettuce growing in the pounding rain, it's better if you have some sort of protection. Okay, and then uh, not only do we have that chart and the territorial chart, but we also have a list of resources that you can click on and you can see. You could sit here and read all about all kinds of different things, how to make a cover bed, how to build a cloche, how to uh, do all kinds of things. Uh, so these are interesting links for you to look at, which I am not going to show you except for that. Okay. And uh, these are some resources that I used for this talk. Uh, Vegetable Gardening on Small Farms West of the Cascades is a, is a booklet that is put out by um, Pacific Northwest uh, Extension. And so it has many, many pages of information on it. So that's handy. And uh, of course the Territorial Seed Catalog itself, there's a winter version and uh, it's not very big because we have fewer options, but it has that chart in it and it has uh, lots of instructions. See this on here. And it has, and then the best part about this one is it has individual full list of what to do specifically for that particular seed. Uh, and you can get these free in the mail and they're also available online. In fact, this is it right here. I think this is it. You just click right on it and it has this cute little thing that you can turn the pages on. I'm always entertained by these things. See? Isn't that cute? I think that's cute. Of course, you can zoom it in, too. Okay. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, my talk.